Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox here at today's top stories. Columbus police released body cam footage of an officer involved shooting on Tuesday. We take a closer look at what happened. Derek Chauvin has been found guilty, but many groups are saying this isn't enough. Police need to be abolished. An expert on Marxism says racial tensions are being used to spark a revolution in the United States, and the Chinese Communist Party is behind it. The House passed a Democrat-backed bill today that's based on the narrative that Trump's travel ban discriminated against Muslims and African nations. Some Oklahoma lawmakers are pushing back against President Biden's executive orders. The state Senate passed a bill that would allow the state to request exemptions from the executive orders if they're deemed unconstitutional. And parents in Seattle concerned about a homeless camp near their children's school. As in-person classes start back, some in the encampment also voice safety concerns. An officer-involved shooting in Ohio resulted in the death of a 16-year-old girl. In an unusual move, the Columbus Police Department released body cam footage just hours after the incident. NTD's Christina Kim tells us what happened. On April 20th in Columbus, Ohio, 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant died after a fatal police shooting. Police responded to a 911 call about an attempted stabbing. The Columbus Police Department quickly released body camera footage of the incident. In a slowed down version of the footage, you can see an officer approaching a driveway where a group of people are standing. Micaiah lunges at one woman and tries to stab her. The woman falls down. She then lunges at another girl with the same knife. As the knife nears the girl's neck area, the officer fires what sounds like four shots, hitting Bryant. That's what the police that, did. That lady she, came on the floor? After, she came after me. With so, a knife? Yeah, so she so he got her. Officials say they requested a medic 90 seconds after the shots were fired. Six minutes later, a medic arrived on the scene and Bryant was transferred to the hospital, where she was later pronounced dead. Micaiah's aunt Hazel Bryant told 10TV her niece lived in a foster home in the area and had gotten into a fight with someone else at the home. Her mother said Micaiah was a loving girl who promoted peace. Ned Pettis, the director of public safety, says he understands the outrage and emotion around this incident. A teenage girl is dead. And she's dead at the hands of a police officer. Under any circumstances, that is a horrendous tragedy. But he says the video footage shows that there's more to the story. And though it's hard, wait for the facts as determined by an independent investigation. We have to ask ourselves, what information did the officer have? What did he see? How much time did he have to assess the situation? And what would have happened if he had taken no action at all? Interim Police Chief Michael Woods was asked if the officer should have used a taser instead of a firearm. If there's not deadly force being uh, per- per- perpetrated on someone else at that time, an officer may have the opportunity to have cover, distance, and time to use a taser. But if those things aren't present and there is an active assault going on in which someone could lose their life, the officer can use their firearm to protect that third person. Mayor Andrew Ginther says the city will prioritize more transparency and take steps so this doesn't happen again. He also said the community needs to address the recent spike in violent crime and to give young people a positive path to a brighter future. Christina Kim, NTD News. After the conclusion of the Derek Chauvin trial, the Department of Justice launched a civil investigation into Minneapolis City's police practices. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the move. The investigation I am announcing today will assess whether the Minneapolis Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force, including during protests. The investigation will also assess whether the MPD engages in discriminatory conduct and whether its treatment of those with behavioral health disabilities is unlawful. 
Garland said he believes good officers don't want to work in systems that allow bad practices. He also said the challenges faced are woven into the U.S.'s history. Attorneys and other personnel from the DOJ's Civil Rights Division and U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Minnesota will join the investigation. But the DOJ repeatedly declined to give details on why they've launched this investigation. A Virginia officer is fired from his post over a $25 donation to a legal defense fund for Kyle Rittenhouse. Rittenhouse shot and killed two people during the Kenosha, Wisconsin riots after being chased by a mob. Lieutenant William Kelly's alleged donation was revealed after a crowdfunding site experienced data breach. Email addresses of some donors were made visible. Kelly made the donation from a work email address linked to him. The alleged donation from Kelly included the comment, God bless, thank you for your courage, keep your head up, you've done nothing wrong. Norfolk, Virginia's city manager Chip Filer said Kelly's comments were egregious and erode the trust between the Norfolk Police Department and those they're sworn to serve. Kelly can appeal the decision, but it's unclear if he will. And this afternoon, several House Democrats voiced their support for Washington, D.C., becoming the 51st state. A bill to grant D.C. statehood will get a vote in the House this Thursday. House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and three other House Democrats are pushing to make D.C. the 51st state. Tomorrow, uh, once again, we will be considering legislation to assure that the 700,000 plus people who live in the District of Columbia are in fact equal citizens to all their brothers and sisters throughout the United States of America. The district is currently represented by a non-voting delegate in the House and no senators. Right now, the D.C. delegate is Congressman Eleanor Norton, who introduced this bill. If successful, the district residents will be able to elect two senators to represent the Democratic-leaning state. Under the bill, the new U.S. capital city would be limited to two square miles surrounding the White House, Capitol, Supreme Court, and National Mall. Again, we're excited that we will pass it, we will celebrate, and we hope that that momentum will help it pass in the Senate so that the president can sign it into law. The Biden administration has officially backed statehood for D.C. on Tuesday. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser thanked Biden in a tweet. Meanwhile, House Republicans oppose the bill, arguing the push is a power grab. The Attorney General of 22 states said in a letter on April 13th that if Congress passes the bill and President Biden signs it into law, they will use every legal tool to defend the U.S. Constitution. This bill is expected to get a vote in the full House this Thursday. The House today passed a bill that would limit the president's ability to restrict people from entering the U.S. It's a response to Trump-era travel bans that some saw as discriminatory. NTD's Melina Weiskup has the details. The No Ban Act was introduced by California Democrat Judy Chu. It would strip a sitting president of the power to issue travel bans from certain countries, even if those countries are deemed as national security threats. The bill reads, before imposing a restriction, the State Department and DHS shall consult with Congress. It also prohibits religious discrimination in immigration decisions. The Democrat-backed bill is based on a years-long narrative that Trump's travel ban was an act of discrimination against Muslims and against African nations. President Biden rescinded the bans, but we must pass the No Ban Act to prohibit any future president from issuing discriminatory bans. In 2018, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Trump's order, saying it had legitimate purposes, preventing entry from nationals who cannot be adequately vetted. House Republicans say labeling Trump's ban as discriminatory is inaccurate because it was meant to protect America from nation states rife with terrorism. It is literally not true. It is absolutely not true. Given that policy covers just 8% of the world's Muslim population and is limited to countries that were previously designated by Congress or prior administrations as posing national security risks. He's referring to the fact that former President Obama designated seven Middle Eastern countries as areas of concern. The bill that they all voted for in 2015 that Obama signed into law called the Visa Waiver Program Improvement and Terrorist Travel Prevention Act of 
2015. Trump's ban, now rescinded by Biden, restricted travel from 13 countries, including Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, Yemen, and others. Trump this week called on Biden to reinstate the travel ban to protect America from terrorism. But this bill would make it impossible for Biden or any future president to create such a ban. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Dozens of people in Mexico were given fake versions of the Pfizer vaccine. An official says they don't know what was injected, but Pfizer says it wasn't their vaccine. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story. In Nuevo León, Mexico, about 80 people were vaccinated with fake doses of the Pfizer vaccine after buying them. Reports say arrests were made and the incidents being investigated. The state's health secretary told the Mexican press that this is happening because there isn't enough vaccine to go around. Today, here in Nuevo León, there's a trafficking of vaccines because there aren't any. And I hope we can get this under control. Yes, I've had contact with some patients who were vaccinated. They're fine. Fortunately, they're okay health-wise, but they're very worried because they don't know what they were given. Well, Pfizer told the Wall Street Journal that it wasn't their vaccine after analysis. Pfizer also identified fake versions of their vaccine from Poland. President Biden says his administration's reached a milestone, 200 million COVID vaccines given in his first 100 days. Now that vaccines are available for everyone 16 and up, Biden's calling on younger Americans to get the shot. He's also calling on employers to give their workers the time off they may need to get vaccinated. So to make sure this policy comes at no cost to small or medium-sized businesses with fewer than 500 employees. The, R the IRS is posting instructions for how employers can get reimbursed for the cost of providing paid leave for their employees to get vaccinated and recover from the side effects if they have any. The IRS says companies will be reimbursed with tax credits. And here's an update on vaccine passports. South Dakota has banned them. Governor Kristi Noem says she signed the executive order on Wednesday. In a statement, she said, I encourage all South Dakotans to get vaccinated against COVID-19, but we are not going to mandate any such activity. But this only bans the state and local governments from using them. In other words, private businesses and South Dakotans can still use them. Steph, I'll toss it back to you. Thanks, Miguel. And homeless encampments spilled over onto a school property in a major West Coast city, but the school and local government refused to do anything. Parents and locals talked with NTD, expressing their fear of what's to come. This is the backyard of a public school in North Seattle. As middle schoolers returned to Broadview Thompson K-8 through for in-class instruction on Monday, April 19th, local parents are trying to get the encampment removed. One parent cites the prevalence of drug use in the camps. There's already been one overdose death from the encampment and the woman's body laid just outside the camp on our street for about three hours. According to Christy Reddy, she contacted local officials last August when the camp started as several tents in a government-owned section of Bitter Lake Park. She says workers from a government construction project relocated the tents to another area of the park next to the school. Putting them uh, from parks department onto the school department, you know, helped the parks department, but it then in labor, the school district with this issue, it can, it's really one space if you looked at it. Reddy says she emailed the school board president about the 50 plus tent encampment. As a result, she says she was warned to not trespass on school property. But I thought it was interesting that she thought my handing out flyers uh, would be worth a trespassing violation, but somebody living in a tent is not. The school board decided to allow the encampment to remain on school property. Hi. They describe it as a teachable moment for students to learn compassion. This is about the safety of the kids. The kids cannot walk to safe, safe to school, and if we cannot give them safety, there is no compassion. Ocean Green's two children attend Broadview Thompson. He is an Albanian immigrant who came to the U.S. with $100 to his name. He says the opportunity he received from the United States is actual compassion. They're not compassion to the kids or the residents or anything, and not even to the campers. They're not compassion. They're not compassion to anyone. So we have chosen to have our kids to do remote schooling since it's safe to walk to the school. Both Green and Reddy said locals would find ways to clean up the area of damage, syringes, and even human feces if the school helps to remove the encampments. 
They asked the school to provide assistance to people living there and to make a plan to stop this from happening again. Neither the mayor's office nor the school board responded to NTD's request for comment. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom released their annual report for 2020. They say the Chinese regime's human rights abuses could be the worst development of all. NTD's Don Tran has the details. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom says religious freedom in China has deteriorated. The commission says the Chinese communist regime has intensified its persecution of Christians, Muslims, and other spiritual groups. The regime detained millions of Uyghur Muslims in labor camps and has continued its decades-long practice of forcibly removing organs from live Falun Gong practitioners. It's disgusting. How does this represent the values of the Chinese people? It does not, but it does represent the values of the Chinese Communist Party. A bipartisan group of lawmakers recently introduced new legislation to stop China's state-sanctioned practice of forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. The bill would allow the U.S. to sanction any individuals and government officials responsible for organ harvesting. USCIRF Commissioner Gary Bauer says the bill is heartening, but that much more needs to be done. Uh, our own government needs to keep the pressure on in international bodies. Uh, we need to keep raising these issues in any bilateral negotiations with the Chinese government. And we need to speak up for the oppressed people living under Chinese communist rule. As one of his last actions, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo declared the Chinese regime's treatment of Uyghur Muslims genocide. Some researchers have also labeled the persecution of Falun Gong practitioners as genocide. Bauer says the world should keep a close watch on it. But it's certainly the kind of thing that we've seen in the past where an oppressive government uh, tries in a variety of ways to eliminate a whole group of people, whether it's an ethnic group or a religious group or people that follow a particular uh, philosophy. The commission urges the U.S. to redesignate China as a country of particular concern and to enforce existing laws to the fullest extent on the Chinese Communist Party. Don Tran, NTD News. Senators Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and three House Republicans are introducing a new bill. It aims to block China and other adversaries from buying land near U.S. military bases. If passed, the bill would prevent communist China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea from buying land within 100 miles of any U.S. military installation or within 50 miles of any military area on U.S. soil. It would also allow the Department of Defense to block construction in areas under investigation. Senator Cruz said the bill ensures regimes like the Chinese Communist Party don't have the ability to intercept and disrupt military activities. And a bill in Texas would dedicate a Memorial Day to victims of communism. The Texas House recently passed it. A co-sponsor of the bill tells NTD why he believes it's crucial that Texans commemorate victims of communism. NTD's Allison Lee has the story. So uh, HB 1057 creates an annual Memorial Day for victims of communism. Um, and it commemorates, or, or it is set on November 7th, which is the day that the Bolsheviks seized power uh, from the Russian government and established the first ever communist regime. In just a hundred years, communism has been responsible for the deaths of at least a hundred million innocent people. This is more than any other event in human history. Oliverson tells NTD this is why we need to dedicate a day to commemorate those people. Texas State Representative Tom Oliverson introduced House Bill 1057 earlier this year, and it passed the Texas House overwhelmingly last week. A Senate committee is currently looking at the bill. So that we never forget the tragedy, just the unbelievable human tragedy uh, that communism has left in its wake, and so that our children and our children's children never forget that communism uh, makes a lot of empty promises and delivers on misery. He says when he talks to people, we have escaped communist regimes. He always reminded of how miserable life is under communism. Oliverson fears that young people in this country aren't aware of those atrocities. He gives forced organ harvesting in communist China as an example. I was horrified um, in conversations that I've heard, had recently to learn of the Chinese government's abuses of political prisoners by forcing them to donate organs 
uh, for transplantation against their will. And Researchers say these innocent, unwilling donors die painfully in the operating tables. It's a secretive and extremely lucrative venture for China's communist regime. To stop forced organ harvesting in China, Oliverson has introduced another bill that will prohibit Texas from awarding research grants to entities that partner with Chinese hospitals and organ transplantation. Going forward, he hopes people can take a moment on November 7th to think about the atrocities of communism. Hopefully, just like we remember the Holocaust and we remember the horrors of the Nazi regime and fascism, that we would also remember, equally so, that communism itself uh, is an equal if not greater threat to innocent human life. Oliverson urges people who have left communist countries to speak up and share their life experiences. In 2017, then-President Donald Trump established the first National Day for victims of communism on November 7th. Since then, at least 10 states have followed suit. Florida lawmakers unanimously passed similar legislation on Wednesday. Allison Lee, NTD News. When an individual is affected by illness, their family and community are all affected. And it's no different for individuals dealing with depression. However, there are Americans working hard to strengthen themselves and their communities to help everyone get through the difficult times. NTD's Kay Rubicek has the story. Where am I going and why? I don't say it often, I don't say it enough. Two-thirds of people with a mental illness get no treatment. Watch as I demonstrate. It's like fishing. Fishing with a needle in my leg. What reactions do you get when you tell people that you study happiness? I wasn't sure that we could solve this issue, but I know it is possible. Depression rates skyrocketed in 2020. Signs of depression tripled almost everywhere across the nation. And so far in 2021, we haven't seen enough signs of it dropping. So what can we do to help ourselves, our loved ones and our communities? Well, we met some amazing people who are doing just that. They're tapping into modern, traditional and new digital technologies to make it happen. I know that I'm depressed when Basically, I don't want to take care of myself. When I start getting those in my head, that's when I know I need to do something about it so I'm not dwelling on those really bad thoughts. I do believe there was depression totally coming from the spiritual confusions. The patients come in and say, I don't know why I have to live. What's the meaning and the purpose? I have no meaning and the purpose to be here. So in Chinese medicine, we don't separate the mind from the body because they are really the two sides of one coin. So you take deep breaths. Okay, they're already in. Oh, it's in. Okay, I, I didn't feel anything. It's like energetic detox, so to speak, or emotional detox. I tell people that I study happiness and they immediately go to distress. Happiness and distress are, you know, different sides of the same coin, but um, I'm, I'm always surprised that, uh, that that's, that's where people's heads go a lot of the time. You're kind of bringing together the science plus the technology. Technology, I think, is really promising. It's not replacing anybody because I think every... Everybody needs different things, but it's providing another option, a robust option, and a medical device doing something that maybe 20 years ago only a therapist was doing. Um, that's pretty exciting. Pop the hood on your mental engine. Therapy will not cause you to grow lady bits. You can't fix your mental health with duct tape. I mean, this is just amazing. Did you know that men have feelings too? No, not just the hippies. All of us. Hello, I'm Dr. Rich Mahogany. Welcome to Man Therapy. Good marketing is really getting about relating to somebody, right? So they really see themselves in it. They can un discover that truth. Watch the full episode of Life and Times every week on NTD Television. Coming up, police reveal the details of the shooting at a grocery store yesterday. The gunman was an employee of the store and visited his manager less than an hour before the shooting. And in Washington, D.C., two teenage girls are charged with murdering an Uber Eats driver. More in just a moment here on NTD News.
The police have revealed the details and possible motive of yesterday's shooting at a stop and shop grocery store. NTD's Jason Perry tells us more. Just prior to the shooting, stop and shop employee Gabrielle DeWitt Wilson spoke to his manager about transferring to another location. 40 minutes later, Wilson returned to the store, went to the manager's office and opened fire, killing one employee and injuring two others. He got away on foot and hid inside a residential building. He secured the building and at some point he tried to make a run down to the first floor. He was trapped like a, a, a mouse in a trap by the fact of Hempstead locking and shutting one door as he was going in that direction and our BSO team coming from behind, which was able then to get him in control and arrested. Nassau County Executive Lori Karen and others at the press conference praised the local law enforcement for their work. And the fact that he was apprehended so quickly and so professionally while keeping the surrounding community safe, again, doesn't happen by accident. It's a testament to the professionalism and training. Arresting Gabrielle Wilson was a joint effort. Members of the local community, the local police departments, and the FBI all cooperated together. They arrested the armed and dangerous suspect without incident or further violence. Jason Perry, NTD News. In Washington, D.C., prosecutors are offering a plea deal to two teenagers. The 13 and 15-year-old girls are charged with murdering an Uber Eats driver. NTD's Lynn Lynn brings us that and more about a surge of carjackings in D.C. Lawyers said Tuesday they're negotiating a plea bargain in the case of two teen girls charged with felony murder and armed carjacking in D.C. The victim, 66-year-old Uber Eats driver Mohammed Anwar. Both girls are being prosecuted as juveniles, even though D.C. law allows 15-year-olds who commit the most serious crimes to be tried as adults. D.C. police told WUSA 9 there's a surge in carjackings throughout the city, and most of those arrests involve children. The outlet says D.C. had more than 100 carjackings in the first quarter of this year. That's almost five times the same time last year. D.C. police say they've set up a team of detectives specialized in robberies and violent crimes to address the surge in carjackings. Lin Lin, NTD News, Washington, D.C. If you've been wanting to visit the Big Apple but weren't sure because of restrictions, now is your time. New York City is welcoming tourists with open arms. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story. New York City is launching its biggest tourism campaign ever. Today, we're going to spark our economic recovery with a new $30 million marketing campaign to bring back the tourists. The campaign aims to let people know New York is open for business and that it's safe to visit. It will go out through social media, TV, influencers and more. It will be focused on Northeast regional and domestic travel more broadly to start. Domestic travel typically represents about 80% of our visitor volume in any given year. According to the New York Times, New York City's economy has been harder hit by the pandemic than other cities because it depends on tourism a lot. In normal years, the hospitality industry accounted for $46 billion of spending each year. Arian Pastar, NTD News, New York. Still to come, soon you'll be able to get Abbott's home test kit for COVID-19 at your local drugstore. Find out how much it'll cost. And NASA will reuse a SpaceX rocket and capsule to send people to the International Space Station. That and more in just a moment on NTD News. Hey everyone, today's an exciting day. I'm joined by my old friend, Mr. Ellis Williams, AKA Mr. Biggs, one of the founding fathers of hip hop from the mighty Soul Sonic Force who, by the way, happened to be a Car Shield customer, and I had no idea. When I saw you representing Car Shield, I knew Car Shield was the real deal. You've always been official. You called me and you told me, you said, man, I got Car Shield, and it worked. What made you get it? You know, I was actually watching a football game at the time. Car Shield commercial came on. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? I have this old SUV, and I know the manufacturer warranty is about to run out. I don't want to get stuck with expensive car repairs. Right. So I gave Car Shield a call covers was very affordable and it was no long-term contract. A few months after that, transmission went on my car. I took it to my mechanic. The mechanic knew of CarShield. They called CarShield and saved my family and I $2,400. 
Car Shield is America's number one auto protection company. Their administrators have paid out over a billion dollars in claims and cover most vehicles from 5,000 to 150,000 miles. When I bought my used car, I didn't expect any problems right away. But when it broke down, I'm glad I had Car Shield. Car Shield saved me over four thousand dollars and followed through with their commitment. Thank you, Car Shield. I've been a Car Shield customer for close to seven years. Had three vehicles covered, and they saved me close to nine thousand dollars. With coverage through Car Shield's administrators, you'll receive twenty-four-seven roadside assistance, courtesy towing, rental reimbursement at no additional charge. Plus, with Car Shield's nationwide coverage network, you can choose the mechanic or dealership of your choice, no matter where you are. If you're driving without a warranty, you have to call Car Shield. Yeah, you do. Give Car Shield a call today before it's too late. Remember, Car Shield cars go farther. Protect yourself now against expensive auto repair bills. Call Car Shield for a free and instant protection plan quote. Once your car breaks down, it's too late. Call 800-545-5325. That's 800-545-5325. The Department of Agriculture is extending its free school lunch program through 2022. That means school meal programs will resume for students this fall as schools reopen. Schools can continue to be flexible in when they serve their meals. This is to prevent too many people gathering together at one time. They can also continue serving breakfast and after school snacks. The USDA says this ensures children are getting nutritious options like fruits, vegetables, whole grains and milk. The department says up to 12 million children may not be getting enough to eat at home during the pandemic. And in a world first and seemingly a step closer to making life multi-planetary, NASA will reuse a SpaceX rocket and capsule to send people to the International Space Station. NTD's Arlene Richards has the details. For the first time, NASA is using a recycled SpaceX rocket and capsule. The Falcon 9 rocket will soon transport the SpaceX Dragon capsule to the International Space Station. That'll be a, another first and a very important thing, as we all have talked before, uh, flying um, on, on reused vehicles, on flight-proven vehicles, which is ultimately what helps us make life multiplanetary. The four veteran astronauts who will soon be hurtling through space include NASA astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur, Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Akahiko Hoshidi, and European Space Agency astronaut Thomas Pesquet. The first time three nationalities are in a dragon. The International Space Station itself is a, a big collaboration between among uh, 15 countries. Uh, so it is very important to do uh, a lot of international cooperation. Thomas Pesquet, who is French, is concerned the French government will strip him of his citizenship if he doesn't bring French cuisine on board. Uh, it has been a tradition really since the 90s and now even the 80s, the first French mission was in 82. Um, and there's always been special dishes being prepared by chefs or, or regular cooks um, for space stations. The launch, originally scheduled for Thursday, is postponed because of unfavorable weather conditions. Now, although the weather is probably going to look great here at the launch site, we're worried about those downrange winds and wave heights in case of an abort. Takeoff is now scheduled for Friday at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Abbott's rapid home tests for COVID-19 will soon be available for purchase. They're called Binax Now self-tests, and you can buy them without a prescription. At first, they'll only be sold at CVS, Walgreens, and Walmart. They should be available in the next few days online and in some stores. You can buy the Binax Now self-test in two count packs for $24. Abbott says it's the most affordable and most studied COVID-19 rapid test in the U.S. The FDA gave the tests emergency youth authorization. It can also be used on children as young as two years old and gives results in about 15 minutes. And coming up, suspected Chinese hackers spying on the U.S. defense industry. How did they get through and how long has it been going on? And while Congress is divided on whether to modernize America's nuclear forces, two Pentagon leaders are warning that China and Russia have been upgrading their nuclear arsenals. That and more on NTD News. A 
cybersecurity firm says Chinese hackers have been spying on the U.S. defense industry for months. But we don't know which agencies or groups they breached. NTD's Patrick Hayden takes a look. Researchers say that at least two groups of China-linked hackers have spent months spying on the U.S. defense industry. A previously undisclosed vulnerability in American virtual private networking devices was used by the hackers. Utah-based IT company Avanti issued a statement on Tuesday confirming the vulnerability and says that a very limited number of customers were targeted. These were customers that used Avanti's Pulse Connect Secure Suite. At the same time as Avanti's announcement, cybersecurity firm FireEye released a statement. It said it suspected that at least one of the hacking groups was operating on behalf of the Chinese government. The president of an arm of FireEye, Mandiant, says the hackers were operating from U.S. digital infrastructure. They have been borrowing naming conventions of their victims to camouflage their activity. A Chinese embassy spokesperson says China firmly opposes and cracks down on cyber attacks and says FireEye's allegations are irresponsible and ill-intended. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. The U.S. National Security Agency declined to comment on this issue. For years, American officials have blamed Chinese state-backed hackers for a number of digital attacks, from theft of American military secrets to research data. Back in 2020, cybersecurity company FireEye sounded the alarm about a Chinese hack targeting devices made by two U.S. tech companies. The attackers infiltrated a number of companies' computer systems in the attempt. FireEye has called the breach one of the biggest cyber attacks by a Chinese hacker it's seen in years. And while Congress is fighting over the U.S. defense budget, two Defense Department officials warn about rising nuclear threats. The danger comes from two of America's biggest adversaries. NTD's Juliet Song has more on that. If that fails... The man overseeing America's nuclear forces is giving lawmakers a serious warning. That's as Congress debates whether to stop modernizing America's nuclear weapons. For the first time in our history, the face, nation is facing two nuclear-capable strategic peer adversaries at the same time. One of those adversaries is China. Richard says the Chinese Communist Party is rapidly expanding and upgrading its nuclear weapons arsenal. They are well ahead of the pace to double their stockpile by the end of the decade. And I further submit that the size of a nation's weapon stockpile by itself is a very crude measure of what they can do with that capability. He says Beijing is now able to deploy nuclear weapons in its own region and will soon be able to reach other continents. I offer for China is important to look at what they do, not what they say, and where they're going, not where they are. And I have no choice but to view China as a significant strategic threat and share Secretary Austin's assessment that China is the pacing threat for the nation and DOD at large. And China's military threat doesn't stop at land or the sea. It also comes from space. The U.S. Space Commander Chief says right now China has more than 400 satellites in orbit. China is building military space capabilities rapidly, including sensing and communication systems and numerous anti-satellite weapons. All the while, China continues to maintain their public stance against the weaponization of space. On top of that, the Defense Department official says Russia also remains a pacing nuclear threat. Aggressively engaged conventional and nuclear capability development, modernization, and are now roughly 80 percent complete while we are at zero. It is easier to describe what they're not modernizing, nothing, what, than what they are, which is pretty much everything. Item 133, first stage ignition, two missiles. He says America's nuclear force is hindered by aging weapons and underinvestment. A nation simply cannot attempt to indefinitely life extend leftover Cold War weapon systems and successfully carry out the assigned strategy. The Defense Department says maintaining a powerful and advanced nuclear arsenal is critical for America's national security. And it comes with an expensive price tag. Modernizing America's nuclear forces could cost $1.7 trillion over the next 30 years. Some Democrat lawmakers are urging the Biden administration to cut the funding. But they've received strong pushback from Republicans. 
It remains to be seen how the spending battle will turn out. The Biden administration is currently reviewing nuclear strategies and is set to present a full defense budget this spring. Julia Song, NTD News. Still to come, a plan to build a breakaway soccer league in Europe ends with statements of apology. Now sports fans are calling for tighter control of the way soccer teams are run. And video sharing app TikTok could face a damages claim worth billions of dollars. They're alleged to have illegally harvested millions of children's private data in the UK. Stay tuned for more here on NTD News. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct. Redefining insurance. Video sharing app TikTok could face a damages claim worth billions of dollars. They're alleged to have illegally harvested millions of children's private data. The former Children's Commissioner for England, Anne Longfield, has launched a legal claim against TikTok and its Chinese parent company ByteDance. She is making the claim on behalf of 3.5 million children in the UK aged under 13. Longfield alleges that every child that has used TikTok since May 2018 may have had their private personal information illegally collected by TikTok. In May 2018, the General Data Protection Regulation was introduced to give better protection for people's privacy. The legal claim argues that TikTok and ByteDance breached data protection rules by willfully taking children's personal information without sufficient warning, transparency or the necessary consent required by law meaning parents and children don't know what is being done with their private information. The claim calls for compensation for the millions of potentially affected children, which is said could run into billions of pounds. TikTok's policy in the UK do not allow children under 13 to use the app, and those downloading it are asked to input their age when they sign up. But figures suggest that many under 13s use the platform. Although TikTok's policy on data collection is listed on its website, Ms Longfield says, She feels TikTok's practices are hidden and shady. The app asks for children's name, address, date of birth, their likes, interests and habits. Longfield says you shouldn't be doing that when it's kids. In response to the action, TikTok says it has robust policies in place to protect all users and teenage users in particular. They say they will vigorously defend the action. TikTok is one of the world's most popular apps, especially among young people and has around 100 million users in Europe alone. All six English Premier League football clubs have quit the breakaway European Super League. The fans previously angry at the league's creation now have cause for celebration. NTD's Neil Woodrow has the story. The main architect of the Super League, Juventus FC chairman Andrea Agnelli, was asked if the league could continue now with just five or six teams involved. Look, uh, look I think, uh, to, to be frank and honest, no. Um, evidently, that's not the case. So, I mean, I wouldn't be talking so much about whether where that project has gone. I mean, I don't think that, uh, that project um, is uh, now still uh, up and running. 
Manchester City were the first to back out of the European Super League venture on Tuesday evening, followed by Chelsea and the rest of the English clubs. Today, plans for the new league are all but over. Fans were quick to celebrate the news of their club's withdrawal, leading some to feel that apologies are in order. Liverpool's owner John Henry on Wednesday had this to say to fans. I want to apologize to all the fan supporters of Liverpool Football Club for the disruption I caused over the past 48 hours. It goes without saying, but should be said, that the project put forward was never going to stand without the support of the fans. No one ever thought differently in England. Over these 48 hours, you were very clear that it would not stand. We heard you. He went on to say that he was responsible for this endeavour and had let them down. And more clubs from the founding 12 on Wednesday began considering to quit the deal. Atletico Madrid and Inter Milan the first to make it official. Fans were a big force in the change of direction of the clubs involved and were quick to make their feelings known. I'm uh, disappointed with my club, which is Arsenal around the corner, because they were in it, involved in it, and now they're, you know, they've decided because of um, people in the street and, you know, the fans. They said they don't want it, and so they've pulled out, which is a good thing. Other pressure came from the Prime Minister, who expressed his satisfaction on the outcome. Mr Speaker, I welcome the decision taken by the six English football teams not to join the European Super League. The announcement was the right result for football fans, for clubs and for communities across the country. I spoke with Andy Walsh from the Football Supporters Association. He said it was tremendous the solidarity shown across the game to block the European Super League. He said that absentee owners of some of the big clubs do not understand the fans, players and administrators in the game. They're, they're completely wrapped up in themselves and their own ego. They think that cash and wealth buys them everything. But whilst they might own our football clubs in terms of its stocks and shares, they certainly are not aware of its soul and, and its history. But when fans at the grounds came out in numbers, they couldn't be ignored. And it was the reaction and response from supporters on the streets last night, as much as anything else, just telling the owners this was wrong and that, that they themselves would walk away from, from football if this occurred. While these celebrations over the collapse of the project die down, the backlash against the managers involved may continue. Liverpool great Graham Souness is quoted as saying they were going to sell the souls of our major football institutions. I don't know how these clubs will manage to get back on side. Neil Woodrow, NTD News. Bankruptcy is threatening local Parisian shops more than ever. They've been hit especially hard by restrictive measures that prevent tourists in the country. NTD's French correspondent David Vives interviews the owner of a well-loved sweet shop. At 84 years old, Denise Akabo feels full of energy when she works in her shop of 45 years. Here she sells fine chocolates and premium candy. The treats come from all across France, like this chocolate clementine from Corse Island. When you put it in your mouth, you have to roll it around inside. If you gobble it down in a few seconds, I'm not selling it to you. Everyone from French presidents to American actors have visited her shop. But the tourists are the most important customers. Tourism is a top economy activity in France. But since the first lockdown last year, many businesses are going bankrupt. Last year, during the first lockdown, I was earning like 6 euros a day. One day I got 30 euros. That was a good day. I was just sinking, crying, every evening. The fate of Akabo's shop is uncertain. She's already two months late on her rent, and her daughter is pressing her to sell the shop. But she's keeping faith, and her routine goes on. She tells the stories behind the candies to every client, and believes one day American tourists will be back. The American tourists used to empty my shelves of Cousins de Lyon. They loved it so much. You have Cousins de Lyon? Yes, I have Cousins de Lyon. Akabo decorates her shop with presents from visitors. Paris residents also come to comfort her, knowing she needs support. I come regularly. I like chocolate, and it seems this place has a soul. I feel good when I'm here. She says the lockdown has changed the face of the French capital.
These are very, very hard times. A lot of shop owners have sold their shops. Something is changing in Paris. I try to tell myself, just live each day as it is. We don't know what's going on. Some of the restrictive measures will be lifted on May 7th. For Akabo, it's one step closer to the day tourists will return. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And for the French, who spend more time than any other nation eating and drinking, there may be a solution to allow them to enjoy fine dining in their own home, even under lockdown restrictions. France is still observing a nighttime curfew from 7 p.m. every day due to the pandemic. Restaurants have been forced to close down. But if you have enough money, private chefs can bring fine dining to your home. A trained private chef in France says she was busy before the pandemic. Now she's even busier and serves between 60 and 80 meals a month. Now it's true that I have to turn down a lot of requests because I can't split myself in two. It's a bit complicated, but yes, there is a very significant demand. According to a government decree, private chefs are allowed to serve meals at their customers' homes amid the current restrictions. So for people who used to eat out, private chefs are proving popular. Company executives used to organize work dinners or lunches with their clients. And now they have to stay at home and invite their clients there, obviously within the limits of the law. She takes bookings from private individuals, brings her ingredients to their home and uses their equipment to prepare and serve restaurant-quality dishes. Last Friday, she was booked by a customer to prepare lunch for her and her mother. We obviously want to go out, see our friends and family, and share meals with them, but we can't. So this is recreating that moment of exchange at home, and it's really great for that, so I am very pleased. She says she operates within the rules and doesn't work for gatherings of more than six people, or work after the 7 p.m. curfew. But their service is not within the reach of every Parisian. A lunch for two comes in at 170 euros, or about 150 pounds per person. And it looks like everyone working from home wants alternative workplaces. One London firm is offering a pre-made home office that you can set up right in your backyard. NTD's Colin Fredrickson takes a look. On the outskirts of London, an unexpected consequence of the pandemic Garden offices like this one are seeing high demand as part of a trend toward alternative workplaces. In the first two weeks, we got like hundreds of emails from everywhere. The modular home office is designed to be a cozy hideout for gardens and courtyard spaces. So everyone was like really squeezing their living room uh, spaces while in the backyard there was a garden or there was a, a, an empty space that could be used. The first client was like someone that's had to work from home, has a family and uh, probably two kids and he, he, needed, he desperately needed a, a, a safe place where to concentrate. The eight foot tall structure is digitally fabricated, then constructed on site in about a day. A basic module cost about $7,000. The company is hoping to deliver about 15 units this year. One client from Norway is expecting hers later this month. I do my trombone practicing, I do my paint, everything, everything in the same room. And I just thought I need a space where I need, um, where I have uh, something for my mind and something that can give me more clarity. And she's looking forward to showing off her new workplace on video calls. It will be um, a multi-use place. I will definitely have the space to do my work and the envy of my colleagues on the Zoom calls and team calls when they see my background. <laughs> the design firm's co-founder says they're now looking into offering more choices like different exterior options, internal finishes and customized furniture sets. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
We have a new channel. Subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD News. Get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.